We pray with thee. May the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our risen and loving Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Verse 3, John writes, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Okay. And then he goes on and writes, And his commandments are not burdensome. What? Are you sure about that? I understand the idea of we keep his commandments. At least I know that we are supposed to. But... The idea that his commandments are not burdensome? Seriously? Have, have you tried keeping the Ten Commandments? And I'm not talking about just a, a very narrow reading and interpretation of the commandments, like literally, thou shalt not murder. So we everybody, cool? You know, and just the very letter of the law. But what about Luther's explanation? As we expand and we see all these things that not only are we not supposed to do, but these things that we actually are supposed to do. It's hard. Actually, it's impossible. It's impossible, but is that the same as burdensome? Well, let's put a pin in that right now, and, and we'll come to, back to that in, in just a little bit. First, Though I, I want to talk about something that caught my eye last week. This thing that I read in a commentary and it jumped out at me, but it was a little bit too late to include in my sermon last week. However, it still applies to our reading this week. So I, I wanted to get into that. And, and I could even argue even more so it applies this week. Did you notice that in our readings today, there is a little bit of a love fest going on? I mean, I mean, in our epistle reading, we read, you know, uh, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know love, the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God. And it goes on and on. And it's not just in our epistle. In our gospel lesson today, the Father has loved me, so, love, uh, so I love you. Abide in my love. You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Love is mentioned nine times in our reading today. And it's not just today, actually. In these last five Sundays, since we started this season of Easter and have been working our way through the book of 1 John, the word love, or loved, or loves, or beloved, appeared 21 times in those five Sundays. In the whole book of 1 John, this word, or these words, appear 52 times. That is a lot of love. But I guess you should expect that from the guy who referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But why such a heavy focus? We know why John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He saw that as his core identity. What do I want you to know? First and foremost about me, Jesus loves me. Not that he loves me more than he loves you, but that is what I prize the most. But again, why this heavy focus? Well, the thing I ran into last week as I was preparing my, my message was this quote uh, from a commentary on 1 John. And here's the quote. It says, if one asks why love receives so much stress, the answer is likely to be, at least in part, that John is attempting to mend the wounds in the church caused by the departure of the secessionists and to get the remaining faithful Christians to redouble their efforts to create true Christian community, they must rally and pull together. And again, I think sometimes it can be dangerous to, to read scripture, you know, through our contemporary lens and import our setting onto uh, the, the context that the original author was writing to. But there was something about th this quote, this explanation of John including so much love in his epistle that just hit me. 
And it caused me, and again, if I was smarter, maybe I would have thought things like this before, but it really caused me to, to re-examine how I have looked at John's gospel and John's epistle. Let's for a moment re reflect on the unique nature of John's gospel and his other writings. You might know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are sometimes referred to as the synoptic gospel. They, they are very similar to one another. They, can't, they contain a lot of the, the same episodes, the same events, the same teachings. They, they, and they were written in, in, in a similar time. All of John's writings, in fact, all of the writings of the Bible, most of the books of the New Testament are written within decades of the life of Jesus. Just a, a decade or two later, they are all very recent. Again, you have the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are written very, uh, you know, within a, a, a few decades, and, and they contain the, the life and ministry of Jesus. The book of Acts, you know, contains the historical account of how the church began to grow in those first few decades. And Paul, who was writing in the 50s and 60s, in just a few decades after Jesus, is addressing uh, early conflicts that were happening within the church. These are all very early. John, though, who is a very young disciple, who uh, history and church tradition teaches that John is the only disciple who died a natural death. He was writing in the 90s. Not the 1990s that we're going to be celebrating in just a few weeks. No, but, but the original 90s. A lot has happened. The, the temple had been destroyed. The church had been growing, not just how it grew in the book of Acts, but it had been further spreading. John has a very unique view of history. As I was thinking about how to, how to describe this, to, Imagine somebody writing a book about relational dynamics within the culture of the United States, about how different people groups uh, relate to one another and where some conflicts are and where some peace is and just doing that. A book written prior to the 2016 election, prior to 2020 and the pandemic and everything that happened after that, a book written prior to those things would look very different than a book written after those things. A lot has taken place since then. Similar to John's writing. One of the reasons his gospel might look so different is that he is writing in a very different context. And his letter that he is writing, again, if you look at, at uh, he, he talks in this quote that I read, he talks about the secessions, these people that have left the church because of some theological conflicts. And again, it got me thinking, yes, there had been conflict in the church before, but where did that conflict come from? In the gospel, we had people who were opposing Jesus, the chief priests, the elders, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, all the people opposed Jesus. In the book of Acts, you had uh, initially there were, there were the Jews who opposed the, the following of Jesus as the, as the Messiah. And then later there were some idol worshipers who, who didn't like this message of just there being one God. And as Paul is writing his letter, he, his, his main conflict in some ways is the, the Judaizers, the people who were in the church insisting that some people needed to be uh, circumcised in order to be considered Christians or, or still needed to follow various of uh, the Old Testament laws. Or he was struggling with people who were pagans who had recently joined the church and were struggling to divorce themselves from some of their pagan ways and realizing like, oh, we don't do that anymore because we are now in Christ. This is where the conflict was coming from. All new, fresh stuff. John is writing to churches that have been established. There are new generations that have known nothing but the church. But then as always, because, well, we are human, there is conflict. And there are people who are disagreeing with some of John's teachings and bringing in these new Greek philosophies of Gnosticism and, and other teachings that are beginning to pull away from the church and they are leaving the church, whether it's, again, because they're facing persecution or differences in teaching, but people are leaving the church. And that can be demoralizing. Again, going back to, to this quote, if someone asks, 
Why love receives so much stress? The answer is likely to be, at least in part, that John is attempting to mend the wounds in the church caused by the departure of the secessionists. To get the remaining faithful Christians to redouble their efforts, to create true Christian community, they must rally and pull together. Again, you know, we don't have, like, secessionists, really. I, I, I don't know if... if when people leave the church, yes, there are some times that people will have theological dif- disagreements with our church. And as our culture continues to change, that is a, a problem we will continue to face. That as we speak God's truth in, in a face of an increasingly secularized and paganized culture, people will look at us and say, I don't know that I want to have anything to do with that. But there are other reasons that people have just fallen away. We went through this whole thing where everybody took a year or two off of going to church. And a lot of people realized, I don't miss it. I don't really need that in my life. And so much, I was just going through the motions. And that's, yeah, really not high on my priority list. It's not just us. Churches around the country and around the world have shrunk since the pandemic. And, And those who haven't, Well, a lot of them have just benefited from outlasting the church that was down the road and ended up closing, and they gained their members. There are wounds that we receive because of conflict that happens in the church or just people who have left and departed. And so picturing John trying to encourage and trying to rally these these flailing congregations spoke so deeply to me as I look at our current context. It is easy to get demoralized. It is easy to feel fractured. How can we restore this fellowship? How can we foster this fellowship between us? John says, love. Not, Not bitterness or resentment, Not complaining about the people who aren't here, or the programs that we no longer do, or the lack of participation in things. We can't complain people back to church. We can't complain people back into fellowship. John encouraged. And I want to encourage you. And I need encouragement as well. To love. Genuine love. I think fellowship is important. I I, I want to encourage fellowship. I want to encourage whether it's our 90s dinner or going to Hag Lake or trying to find things to do after church or throughout the week. Encourage fellowship with one another. But, but, But looking at this and this context, especially in John's epistle here, what I need to be encouraging is not fellowship, but but love. Not let's hang out together for the sake of hanging out together. That's a good thing to do. But how can we truly, genuinely love one another? Why do we want people to be a part of this fellowship? Not so that our numbers are higher. Not so that our budget is healthier. Not so that we have more people to help out with the various things needing to be done at church. We want people here because they need Jesus. We love them so much that we want them to know what Christ has done for them on the cross, what gifts are freely offered here through the waters of holy baptism, through the body and blood of Christ. We genuinely love them and want them to have that. And as they experience that, fellowship will be created. This, I think, again, goes to what John, when John is talking about this idea of love, and then he goes and he talks about that that his commandments are not burdensome. What, yes, it is impossible to keep God's law, but is it burdensome? I would say love changes all of that. First of all, when you love somebody else, it is not a burden to serve them. You've probably been watched they asked to watch somebody else's kid before, maybe even more than once. You've probably been asked to watch a kid that you like and a kid that you don't like. 
One of those is burdensome. One of those can be a true joy. Making a meal for somebody because somebody asked you to do it and told you to do it, oh, that can be a burden. But when there's somebody you love and care for who is in need, who just got out of the hospital or just had a baby or has something else going on in their life, it can be a true joy to serve that person or have those people over to life. Our love for others turns our service to them into joy. It is no longer burdens. But even beyond that, why are his commandments no longer a burden? Because all has been fulfilled in Christ. This we know what love is, that one would lay down his life for his friends. That Jesus, out of love, has laid down his life for us. Has fulfilled all of the commandments. Has taken that weight of trying to follow God's law in order to appease him. He has taken that burden off of us. That's why in Matthew 11 he's able to say, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. For, for, uh, it, it, it's easy. And, and, and my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Christ has removed that burden of the law from us. He has given us his law so that we can abide in that to share that love with others, that they may also abide with us and abide with him. Amen. And now, may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.